every eye will see and every knee will bow. Good morning, Cornerstone. Please stand as we join in worship this morning. so excited that you're here this morning. Um, we're just going to take a few minutes to greet someone next to you. So feel free to find someone next to you and greet them this morning. Is that like my breath or something? I'm 
Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Bev Williams, and I'm on the missions team here at Cornerstone. And I'm going to introduce our video to you this morning. Uh, we, I'm going to introduce you to Josh and Julie Sanner. And Josh and Julie uh, work with Wycliffe Bible Translators, but they work stateside. Josh is a marriage and family therapist, and... Um, they uh, work with the missionaries going onto the field and coming off the field. And so they're gonna, uh, we're going to show a short video letting you know what they do, and they'll introduce themselves. Lee and I have actually had the privilege of uh, getting to know Josh and Julie when we work in Alaska. And they're just an, a, really a beautiful, delightful family who loves the Lord. And, you know, I just want to tell you, too, the missions team, uh, as a team, we take it very seriously to be responsible stewards of the money that you all give and this last year we you know each year we evaluate the missions partners that we uh, we give to and um, we've added Josh and Julie and some other wonderful missions and and others that we support so uh, enjoy the video thanks I don't know about you but when I hear the phrase global missions, there are several things that come to my mind. I, I think about families or individuals leaving their homeland, transitioning to another culture, learning another language and other customs. I, I think about the gospel being proclaimed in small remote jungle villages or large overpopulated poverty stricken cities. I think about men and women coming to the saving knowledge of Christ when they have God's word for the very first time. For Julie and I, we also think about some other things. We think about missionaries who preach and have very little reception to the gospel. We think about those who struggle with depression, anxiety, sometimes even suicide. We think about marriages that, that struggle and um, sometimes end up dissolving or mission teams imploding. We think about some of the trauma and tragedy that missionaries experience. And while many people turn to missionaries for support, they have very few people who they can turn to. So when we think of global missions, we think about the urgent need for people to come and walk alongside missionaries, especially those who are involved in the painstaking work of taking the word of God and making it available in languages that do not yet have it. You know, that is an amazing opportunity that we have as I serve with Wycliffe to do as it says in the, uh, the book of Galatians, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, when Jesus sent out his disciples to minister, he wanted them to walk in dependence on God for their provision. Wycliffe is a faith-based organization which also asks their missionaries to rely on him through the partnership of individuals and churches. You know, Jesus um, told his disciples that they were to count the cost like a wise man who, who counts that cost before he builds a tower. 
In the same way, Wycliffe takes that very seriously and wants to, in, to ensure that their missionaries have an adequate team of prayer and financial partners who will lift them up throughout their course of service. Julie and I would love for you to join with us as we serve and help bear the loads of missionaries. We desperately need those who will intercede for us, our family, and for those who sit in my office. It's truly the work of the Lord through His Spirit to bring healing and change in people's hearts and lives. We'd also love for you to join with our Wycliffe Ministry in financial partnership. You know, we're excited to start our service here at the JARS Center in North Carolina. Would you consider joining with our family in financial partnership to help us get started in this important ministry? Lots of lights. Good mornings. So glad all of you are here to uh, worship together under this roof and maybe joining virtually as well. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Jason Jabot and, and I serve as an elder here and part of the men's ministry. And um, I've got my third and final child who's leaving the house and it's caused me to reflect quite a bit on uh, the experiences uh, that I've had with my three children, trying to raise them up in the Lord um, in uh, Lake Tahoe, uh, in a small community. And um, this first uh, announcement um, rings true to me because I know that Young Life, specifically their summer camps, has been very helpful, very impressionable, um, has ministered to my youngest daughter. And, um, and so there are signups for the uh, Young Life camps that are coming up. There's more information on all these announcements in the uh, bulletin. Um, and so if you miss something up on the screen and you're not sure, look in the bulletin. There's also, we have uh, what's called the Around the Corner, which is um, a, a digital magazine brochure that you can subscribe to. Um, and so consider that as well. Um, the, other, the other ministry that even though my daughter didn't participate in it, I've always found it to be such a wonderful thing, and that is young men and women coming to our area to teach the game of soccer to young, impressionable kids, right, and also share the gospel with them. And um, another summer is upon us, and we have uh, ambassadors for football soccer camp coming again. And um, I would encourage you parents of young children um, to consider signing them up. Even if they're going, I don't want to play soccer. I don't want to play soccer. Encourage them to. Maybe not to learn the game of soccer, but maybe to hear the gospel one more time, the gospel message. Or maybe just to get the exercise, to be running around so they come home tired, right? And fall asleep when they're supposed to fall asleep, right? Um, and then finally... Not sure what the next slide is, but let's just make sure. Yeah, the kids' ministry. Here's another ministry that our church has in place to minister to young children, not only within this community, but within Kings Beach, where I raise my children and beyond. And so after church today, there is an info meeting. Um, some of the leaders um, are going to be making incredible pizza. I've had their incredible pizza. It's really good. Um, and it's a time for them to share more about their ministry, to hopefully recruit some people to help out with the ministry. They cannot do it with the numbers they have. They need more people to help, right? And they can get you plugged in in ways in which you can feel comfortable, right, um, and not feel like you're extending yourself. And the more we have that can help, then maybe there's not a need for you to help as often, right? So please, please come, have some pizza, and, and allow the kids' ministry to share what they've got going on. Uh, next, um, the Gospel Mission Food Drive. That's been ongoing, and we have a barrel uh, in the uh, foyer out there, and we've been collecting food. Um, as someone who is helping lead in the men's ministry, I'll be sending out a reminder to at least the men saying, hey, um, on April 26th, if you're available to head, head, to head down to Reno to help with um, bagging the food that we collect here um, and maybe even distributing the food, it would be wonderful to have some men.
that can help out with that. Um, they're only looking for perishable food. So if you're thinking, I just need to, I want to donate some food, just uh, non-perishable food, excuse me. I said perishable food, <laughs> correct myself. We don't want salmon thrown in there, unless it's in a can. It's in a can, right? Non-perishable. Okay, next slide. Zambia. We have men and women who are so excited, right, to go on this mission trip. And they're raising money, right, I think to the tune of 30000 for this group of men and women to be able to go to Zambia. And um, one of the ways that they are trying to collect these donations is through the coffee that you can purchase. Um, and so out in the foyer, you can see that there is um, a, a QR code that you can click on and you can purchase a bunch of coffee for yourself and maybe friends and family members. Um, it's delicious coffee. And then the other th way that they're doing this is through an auction, which starts tomorrow, I think at 9 a.m. And this is not just some little rinky-dinky auction. This is, this is something special. I, uh, I clicked on the QR code just to see what they're offering through this, this auction. And there are things regarding food and wine, business and services, fashion and jewelry, art and collectibles, sports, travel. I'm going to get really specific here. Beginner sourdough class. Whoa. All right. Personal cooking lesson from a top chef. Um, let's see. There's, those are just a couple things of the food, but there's more food-related stuff. Um, there's art collectibles. Um, there is a Forever, Forever Friends print. There's a Sir Henry Wilk engraving of the Penny Wedding. There's more art, but I'm going to move on to business services. There's a four one-hour math tutoring sessions. Backcountry chiropractic. Hennessy heating and air. One of our very own. Let's see who else. You want, to get your, um, you want to get your hair partially blonde and cut. So there's hair services. There's child care. Front row parking at Cornerstone. That, that's a big one. That is a big one. Anyways, I'm going to stop there. But there's quite a few items that you can bid on auction, right, as part of this auction to raise money right, for this group that's trying to get to Zambia. And I think it'll be a wonderful thing. Uh, is there anything other than any other slides here? Okay, so few last announcements. That few last announcements. Sorry about that. Um, we have Anthony uh, with Life Child here. Uh, it's a mission organization. Um, their focus is on education and health, nutrition, and social development and spiritual development in Mozambique and South Africa. If you'd like to find out more about that ministry. Um, he will be upstairs with uh, one or more of our deacons in the conference room. And then lastly, here I am in charge of the men's ministry, and I forgot, I guess, to uh, say please put a slide up for us. But the men's ministry, we are having men's mountain bike riding uh, next Saturday. We're meeting here at the church at 8 a.m. It's weather dependent. It looks good, right? Um, I've got two locations in mind. Those locations will work for someone who has an e-bike or I'll call it an analog bike, an old school mountain bike, right? Um, all different skill levels. I've already scoped it out. I've, I rode my bike with a, a good buddy of mine, and I think it'll work for us, right? Both, both locations. Um, and I think that might be it. I'm going to um, lead us in prayer as we continue in worship. Holy, holy, holy is your name, Lord. Your scripture says that Heaven is your throne, and the earth is your footstool. You are sovereign. You are powerful. You are in control of everything. We come before you this morning inside this church and people who are maybe joining virtually, Lord, and we just worship and we praise your name. We are so thankful for you, Lord. Lord, we want to worship, we want to praise your name through this music, through the message, through communion, and it's to your praise, your honor, and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kerry Novak, and I'm an um, elder candidate. And hopefully after this reading, I still will be an elder candidate. 
So if you'll join me, um, we're going to read from Psalm uh, 142. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell him my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains in me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Amen. Will you please stand with us as we continue in worship? Sing out, sing oh, oh, Christ 
that everything we do today with every day forward, God, that we would just have this heart of praise, God, in the highs, the lows, bad days, good days, whatever days you give us, God, that we would have a heart of praise. In your name, I pray. Amen. It is so good to be with you again. And I uh, hope you'll feel the same when I'm done. <laughs> oh, my mind, you know, I am amazed. I've been preaching now for 48 years and probably in that time have preached nearly 4,000 sermons and coming up here any given Sunday is like the first time all over again. My knees knocking together, my heart palpitating, my mouth getting dry, because what a responsibility. For James said, be not many teachers, for we shall incur a stricter judgment. Somehow, some way, when the preachers stand before the Lord, there's going to be an accounting that... uh, is going to be awesome. <laughs> and, uh, but it's so good to be with you. And it was good to hear the, the announcements about Wycliffe. Uh, in my 30 years of pastoring at Sierra Bible Church in Truckee, we supported many Wycliffe missionaries and even sent teams to Ukarampa, uh, Papua New Guinea, to work with translating teams there. And uh, I love the work of the Wycliffe Bible translators. I love those people there. They're good, good people. Jonah. I hear we're in the book of Jonah and I heard that that Ron Falstad was getting the number one and so I called him and I said, I want you to tee it up for me, brother. (laughs) Tee it up and if if we could have that, that slide. There's Ron's sermon from last week. And I just thought in one picture, I would catch us up to date with what Ron preached. (laughs) This is the descent of Jonah, and there's a story behind this one. At Sierra Bible Church in Truckee, the man who happens to be the custodian of the church is also a world-class artist. And every time, whether when I was still the pastor there, when Pastor Jesse does it now and does a thematic teaching, Jim Mathias always does a picture to go on the back wall, you know, like back here for the messages. And this is my favorite of Jim's. This, if you walk in the foyer of the church at Sierra Bible Church, it's up on the wall. It's eight foot wide and six foot high. And Isn't that a sermon all by itself? There we see Jonah tossed in and there's a big old fish eyeballing him and uh, Jonah has no idea of what it's about to happen. And so I'm awfully glad that Ron has opened the door, primed the pump, teed up the ball, and let's see if we can carry it for one more chapter. Jonah chapter two. Jonah chapter 2. I'll start with 117, then we'll jump into it. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed. I think that's an understatement. You know, I'll bet he did. I'll bet he did. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. And you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows uh, passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. 
The waters closed over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the root of the mountains, I went down into the land whose bars close upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. And Father, what an incredible book this is, parked right here toward the end of the Old Testament. And yet it is so full of grace and mercy and gospel. Even Jesus spoke of this man in his ministry and said, just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. There are so many linkages. And Father, this is more than just a great fish story. It's a story where if we will stop and contemplate we can identify with Jonah. We've all been Jonah. We've resisted your call, we've ran. We found ourselves between the rock and the hard place and we cried out and you rescued us and set us back on our feet to move forward in your will. And so Father, I I just pray that this congregation over these four Sundays where Jonah is going to be proclaimed, will come to see this man, this prophet, in a brand new light and just appreciate the part that he plays and the example that has been set for us. So Lord Jesus, we ask that you would speak to us now as only you can. And the Apostle Paul said, through the foolishness of preaching. And so I pray once more that you would touch these lips to proclaim your word to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we find our wayward prophet crying out to God from the belly of a specially prepared fish in which he spent three unforgettable days. Just a little bit about Jonah, and if I repeat something that Ron said last Sunday, um, that's okay, it'll help you remember it. Jonah lived somewhere between 200 and 250 years after King David. It was while Jeroboam II reigned over Israel and Amaziah, the father of Uzziah, reigned over Judah. He was from Gath Hefer. That was about three miles from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. We have record of Jonah prophesying during the reign of Jeroboam II in 2 Kings 14.25. And we read there, he, Jeroboam II, restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the word the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. And the reason I mention this is because much of Jonah's prayer from the belly of the fish echoes the cries that we find in the Psalms of David. And like I said, this is 250 years later. So these Psalms were no doubt familiar to Jonah. And though David never experienced life from the inside of a fish, the Psalms are full of his crying out to to God in times of distress. And here's some that echo Jonah's cry. Psalm 18, four through six, and this is in your study guide. The cords of death encompassed me. 
The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Boy, doesn't that sound an awful lot like what Jonah is crying out from the belly of the fish? There's some desperate crying out here. And it sounds like David could have been in a fish's belly no matter where he's crying out from here. And then again in Psalm 69, we read in verses 1 through 3, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the mire where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary without with my crying out, my throat is parched, my eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. And then again in verses 14 and 15, deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. What's very interesting here is in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, Jonah said that the cry of his distress was not coming from the belly of the fish, but it was coming from the belly of Sheol. In the Hebrew language, Sheol can be synonymously used with hell. And what Jonah is saying here is that Jonah experienced in that fish's belly, three days and three nights of living hell. And that's what he's crying out. He said, I'm crying out from the pit of hell, not just from the belly of the fish. But even the prophet David, in his Psalms, he lets us know that even in hell, one cannot escape the presence of God. Psalm 139, seven and eight says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, that's kind of a Jonah line, your right hand shall hold me. These are huge words. Being cried out, not only from King David the psalmist, but also from the prophet Jonah, as he spends three days. I mean, can you even imagine three days in the belly of the fish? Now, Jonah has an epiphany while in the belly of the fish. In verse three, he says, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. Your waves and your billows passed over me. Jonah's epiphany, he now sees that it was God, not the sailors, who cast him into the sea. This was God's doing. And though Jonah's world was collapsing around him, he was able to recognize that God was the one in control, that God was pulling the strings, that God was in control of the situation. A couple Sundays ago, I was speaking to a congregation from a psalm. Uh, we don't have time to read the whole psalm today, but I would invite you to write it down in the margin of your study guide and take it home and uh, spend some time there. And it's Psalm 77. And in Psalm 77, a psalm written by Asaph, who was one of David's chief musicians, he had fallen into a pit of despair and he's struggling to get out. It was Asaph's where is God moment. Now, I don't know about you, 
Have any of you ever had a, a where is God moment? You wonder, what in the world is going on? Where are you? What are you doing? Are you even there? And that's where Asaph is in Psalm 77. You know, in the mid-1980s, my dear friend Philip Yancey wrote a book that's still my favorite of all of his called Disappointment with God. And if we are honest, every one of us at some time or another have been disappointed with God. He has not performed up to snuff. He hasn't done it the way that we think he should have done it. Or he's maybe not doing it presently in the way you think he ought to be doing it. But in that book, Disappointment with God, as you study and as it goes back to the scripture, you find out that when I come to those places in my own life, my where is God moments, my Jonah moments, my David moments, my Asaph moments, it is usually not God who is in the wrong. <laughs> in fact, 100% of the time. And it's usually I am lacking some information that I desperately need to make sense out of this moment and how God's sovereign hand is still holding me. Asaph gets to the place in the first half of this psalm that here's what he's asking. Will the Lord reject forever? Has his mercy ceased forever? Have his promises come to an end? Has he forgotten how to be gracious? Has he withdrawn his compassion? Been there? I have, and I'm sure I will be again at some time. Where is God? Where is God? And then verse 10 of Psalm 77 in the, in the New American Standard Bible, and I love the translation here. It's a, one of the things in, in Psalm 77, in other Psalms, there's a word selah that you'll see every once in a while out in the margin, that is a musical interlude. These were songs. This is a musical interlude. And whenever you come to the word selah, it means, whoa. Let's stop, let's think, let's contemplate, let's take this in. And on the heels of Asaph saying, where are you, God, and will you ever be faithful again? It says selah. It's like he's finally spent. He's spent. He spent, and then he has an aha moment. And in verse 10 it says, Then I said, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. It is my grief. You know, we serve a God who's immutable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Asaph, after he goes through this whole litany of God not being faithful, he comes to the place and he says, God hasn't changed. I've allowed my circumstance to change my view of God. And in that place, he begins to accuse God. It's changed that much. But once he finally settles down and lets his heart settle, he says, it's my attitude, it's my heart. God hasn't changed. I've let my circumstance change my feelings about God. And after a time of contemplation, Asaph proclaimed his own remedy. In Psalm 77, 11, he says, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. And likewise, Jonah in the belly of the fish in verse seven echoes these words when he says, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. My brothers and sisters, whether it's Jonah, whether it's Aphis, or whether it's David, or whether it's you, and whether it's me, one's personal path to healing and to wholeness and deliverance, more often than not, begins with a recognition of the truth of our situation. 
Jonah comes to the place that he realizes he has no one else to blame for his predicament. There's no one else he can point a finger at. There's no one else he can accuse. He brought this upon himself. And as a pastor for almost 50 years and doing a lot of pastoral counseling, I can tell you this. It's when somebody realizes that they did something that contributed to the mess they are now living in that the first step to healing begins. It's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And then verse nine reveals some of this change of heart. Remember, he's been, he's been thrown into the sea. He sees that it was God who threw him in the sea, not, not just a bunch of sailors. He's there, he's crying out to God, and in verse 7 he says, he starts remembering God, and the things of God. I mean, he's been there for three days and three nights. How long did it take me to read those nine verses? Not very long, huh? So there's a lot going on here that we don't get a picture of, and I wish I had a picture of it all. But verse 9 reveals a change of heart in the prophet. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you What I have vowed I will pay, salvation belongs to the Lord. There's a whole thing happening here. Jonah in his rebellion is thrown into the sea. He's swallowed up by this specially prepared fish. And whatever is going on in his heart and his mind, things are starting to click. And this prayer is an incredible prayer. I'm crying out to you, God, from the pit of hell that I recognize that I'm not here because a bunch of sailors threw me overboard. I'm, I'm here because you ordained this moment because I have turned my back on your call. And now, the fish is given a command. Another command. I love this. Probably most of us haven't put this one to memory. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out on dry ground. Isn't that a wonderful verse? (laughs) But God spoke to the fish. Okay, you know, when Jonah finally comes to the place and says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Uncle, uncle, I give and I will do whatever it is you want me to do. And whatever it is you would have me to give. And then, (laughs) wouldn't you love to have been on that beach? And you see this guy that's bleached white from the acids in the fish's belly. And as he already said, weeds wrapped around his head. Oh, come on, people. You know, I'm a very visual person, and when I read stuff like this, I got to get into the story. I want to be on the beach. I want to see this happen. I want to see this guy who's been in the dark for three days, blinking in the sunlight, going, wow. He could even say it backwards. (laughs) Wow. In 1998, John Piper wrote an incredible poem, and it's titled, Jonah. And you can go up online, and you can find it. His website, which is Desiring God, I think it's in their archives, but it is one of the most incredible poems you will ever read. And, you know, it takes, some, uh, it takes a little license and a little liberty Because it's dealing with a Jonah who is 40 years after being vomited out by the fish. In it, 40 years after his experience with the fish, an aged Jonah is telling his story to a group of young men who are sitting at the prophet's feet. And one of those young men being 
the future prophet Hosea. At this time, this Jonah bears a large scar that goes from his ear to the corner of his mouth. And we are told in the poem that when being vomited out of the fish's belly, his face was cut on one of the fish's razor-sharp teeth. And he comes to recognize this scar as a reminder of grace. And when I read this, I can't help but think of the reminder of grace that God gave the Apostle Paul, a thorn in the flesh that reminded him of the wonderful way that he received the revelation of the gospel of Christ from the Lord, but also a thorn in the flesh that would keep him from exalting himself. A reminder of grace. And I want to share part of this poem with you, and it's in your study guide too, but oh, you've got to go find this and read all of it. Well, you don't have to, but I think you enjoy it. In the poem, Jonah tells the young man what he did after God told him to go to Nineveh. So here it is. God has told him to go to Nineveh. So like a fool, I headed straight the other way. Now, none of us can relate with that, can we? We've heard the word of the Lord, and he says, go that way. And he said, ah. So like a fool, I headed straight the other way to Joppa by the sea. And there, with wings to fly away from God, I thought... I found a ship with open space and bound for Tarshish, far beyond the eye of God. <laughs> yeah, right. So blind the mind that tries to run from God. <laughs> you know, that's why Psalm 139 is so great. Where can I flee from your presence? There's no place that I can go that you are not. And I don't know if Rod brought this out. I'm sure he did because he's a great preacher. But Tarshish is light years away from Joppa. Tarsha was like, was like in Spain. You gotta, you gotta cross the whole Mediterranean Sea from Joppa to get to Tarsha. He is literally heading for the farthest reaches of the kingdom that is known to get away from God. He goes on and he says, and then he fought. <laughs> Oh, the understatement is great. He fought with me and made the sea distraught with great upheaving waves and wind that made the sailors ask who sinned. Then ordered by his sovereignty, the dooming lot would fall to me. And finally, when all else failed, or so they thought, then they availed themselves of one last hope. They threw me into the sea. But Jonah, you are still alive, the boy replied. How can a man survive the tide and depths and monsters of the sea? Because a great fish swallowed me. The boy sat with his lips agape. The mouth of death was my escape. God sought me as it were in hell and swallowed me for a three-day spell. In acid meant to cleanse my soul. From death to death, God's gracious goal leads back to Nineveh and life. And on the way, as with a knife, one razor tooth slashed through my face and gave me this sweet sign of grace. I wish I could be here the next couple of Sundays. I'd like to hear the conclusion to this. <laughs> because no matter what it may look like here, Jonah's lessons are not over. They are far from over. In fact, when you get further on, you wonder, did he learn anything at all in the fish's belly? But he did. And God's grace is sufficient. And he'll walk with the prophet once more. And the next time he says, Jonah, go to Nineveh, guess where Jonah goes? This isn't a trick question. <laughs> he goes to Nineveh. 
But then the drama starts all over again. Next time he's called, though, he obeys. But I want you to understand that we all get ourselves in Jonah-type predicaments at various times. And one of the first things that starts to spring us from our Jonah predicaments is when we own our stuff. And I realize I am in this pit that I presently stand, not because of anything anyone else has done, has said, or could do or say to me. I am here because I have chosen. And I have allowed my circumstance to change my picture of God. I want you to know he's the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just as Jonah, as he realized what, what put him in that fish's belly, and he prayed the prayer that he prayed, and then he finds himself vomited it out on the beach, I want you to know God also stands ready to deliver you from your fish's belly as you graciously come to him and say, you are Lord, you are Lord, you have risen from the dead, and you are Lord. You are the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I come, and I repent, and I own my part in this place, in my life at this time. And Lord, like Jonah, like Asaph, deliver me. And let me once again sing to high heaven the praises of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the story of Jonah is a simple story. I probably heard it. I know that I heard it when I was a child. And my childlike mind amazed at the fish story that was laid out before me. But Lord, there is so much here. And from this time in my life as I look at it, I see an awful lot of Wayne in Jonah, an awful lot of Jonah and Wayne. I've been in my own personal bellies of the fish. And when I cried out in my distress, you answered me. That once again I could raise my heart and my hands and my voices with a voice of thanksgiving and a vow that says salvation belongs to the Lord and Father I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning and I don't know what kind of journey they're all on and somebody mentioned it earlier that you may be on the mountaintop right now and things have not been better and couldn't be better but we know that life goes through cycles and we go through our ups and we go through our downs but thank God that in our ups and our downs you don't change and so I ask that you would give hope to those who are struggling today, struggling spiritually, struggling emotionally, physically, financially, that as they bring it to you, as they take a Selah moment and get quiet in the presence of the one who is King and Savior and Lord, that they will find their deliverance just as Jonah found his. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. What an amazing message today. Amen. Um, as I was re reflecting on what Pastor Wayne was saying, um, it's kind of interesting because the, the verse that God was giving uh, to me as I was thinking about communion for today um, really just was all about God's grace and what that means for us. And the piece that got me in the poem when it talked about the, the fish's tooth grazing Jonah. And he said, this scar is actually what reminds me of God's grace. That thing that I thought was the worst was actually God's biggest amount of grace he could have gave me because he didn't give up on me, because he gave me another way out, <laughs> because his mercy is renewed again and again and again because of what we're about to do because of Christ's sacrifice, we find his mercy again and again and again. And no matter what pit we find ourselves in, no matter what part of life or season 
we find ourselves in, we can take a second for that pause, that I love that, that musical instrumental moment where we can say, you know what, God, thank you for your grace. Maybe it's a grace that gave you that scar that you're thinking about. Maybe it's that grace that brought you down into a moment that wasn't too pleasant, but you needed it to know that God was with you, that he loves you. The verse that was kind of going off for me is uh, Ephesians 2. It says this, starting at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trans, uh, tr- trespasses, may, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. By for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So is that verse and the message that Pastor Wayne gave us today kind of, I wanna just kind of sit over us today as we go into this time of communion. And no matter, no matter where you are, no matter what season you're in, on, the val- on, on top of the hill or in the valley, wherever you are, the one thing that doesn't change is God's grace given to you freely. So as we remember Christ's sacrifice through his, his pouring out his blood and his body, um, I just I encourage you to just reflect, take an instrumental moment to just sit in his goodness, sit in his grace, even when it might be hard to sit in it. So I'm gonna have, um, again, we, we like coming down the sides. Feel free to grab uh, your elements and head back to your seats. Um, and you can actually take, uh, when you get back to your seats, feel free to take um, the elements on your own or um, with your families. Um, and maybe if, if you say a little prayer as you do it, maybe you can just reflect on his mercy for you. So I'm gonna say a prayer over a communion. God, we thank you. We love you. God, as we just stand humbly in your presence, God, as we're, as we're face-to-face with this grace, despite what pit we might be in, God, we're face-to-face with a grace that we don't deserve, a grace that doesn't change. And God, as we're looking eye to eye into this grace. God, I pray that we just reflect. We take a second to say, thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. In your name, amen. Feel free to come forward and receive your elements.
before. Oh 
with your eyes open to the presence of God and follow Jesus on that way. Drink in the riches of God and enjoy the strength of the Lord. And wherever you go, whether you scale the heavens or plunge into the depths, may God's presence be inescapably with you. May Christ Jesus welcome you into his inheritance and may the Holy Spirit assure you that you are God's children. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ, amen. All right, go in peace today and hopefully we'll see you next Sunday. Have a good one. Also, really quick, before you leave, kids' ministry meeting is happening right now. So if you want more info about children's ministry or you wanna get involved, head down there right now. Or if you like P3, 